Hi, I'm Paul Jay, and welcome to a very special edition of the analysis.news on the occasion of the 90th birthday of Daniel Ellsberg. Ninety years ago, Daniel Ellsberg was born, and he has lived a life of meaning. Many of us strive to change the world, but few have the opportunity and the courage to change the course of history. Dan's release of the Pentagon Papers at great personal risk helped end the Vietnam War. His book, The Doomsday Machine, Confessions of a Nuclear War Planner, reveals the institutional madness of American nuclear war strategy. Dan continues to fight for truth and to awaken people to the existential danger of nuclear weapons. I interviewed Dan's friend, historian Peter Kuznick, about the importance of Dan's life, life's work, and I encourage you to watch that. But now, in his own words, is my interview with Daniel Ellsberg on the occasion of his 90th birthday. So at 90 years old, why don't you just take it easy? What what keeps you fighting? How do you summon the strength when sometimes it seems many are just not listening? Hope. Hope that we can surmount the challenges that are facing us, the challenge of ceasing a moral catastrophe that we're already involved in, which is that we have allowed doomsday machines to exist in our country and elsewhere in the world, and that we're on a course toward climate catastrophe as well. And uh, the problem is to avert the physical catastrophes, not probably full extinction on either case, but catastrophic uh, results for humanity if uh, we go on the way we are, if our policies continue as they are. My hope is expressed in action. As a friend of mine, Joanna Macy, says, hope isn't a feeling or an expectation, it's a way of acting. And uh, it's a way of acting as if we had a chance. Uh, and I think that's what we do have. We really do have a chance to change this uh, and to allow a more humane future to evolve. And to what extent is that hope an act of faith rather than rational analysis, because I know you, you've told me you're not all that, all that optimistic when you think about it rationally. I think, by the way, to say that uh, I don't, that one has faith suggests that you're sure, you feel secure in the belief that something will save us, either human or external. I don't have that kind of religious faith, uh, as some do, and I don't have that faith in humanity or in my own country. Uh, as much as I used to in the case of my own country. So I don't think it's a question of any uh, source of guarantee that we'll get through this without absolute catastrophe of a kind that has not been seen in human history or prehistory. Uh, I think that's not only not guaranteed, it's not even likely. But I don't think it's impossible. And given that, I think the way of acting that's appropriate in that possibility that we can uh, eliminate the doomsday machines and change our course of putting fossil fuels in, into warming the, uh, the atmosphere of the earth, causing it's a question of either nuclear winter with the doomsday machine ice uh, on our lakes and uh, killing all our harvests, or fire in effect with uh, the climatic a rise in temperature that will make large parts of the world uninhabitable for humans, even though it doesn't lead to full extinction. So I think both of those are actually likely, but not certain. And if we act in a way to explore, you know, as much as we should, to explore, search, invent, imagine ways of changing this course, uh, it is possible to do it. I have seen, let me go on on that, the, the notion of faith is often always uh, associated in religious terms, especially with miracles. Well, I'm old enough to have seen some miracles, secular miracles in the world. Uh, I was 60 when, uh, when one of those occurred, actually, now I'm 90. Uh, namely, 
as of, say, about 1981, 83, 1981 is what, uh, 40 years ago, if anyone had asked, what is the chance that the Berlin Wall will be down in 89, in eight years? Or if they'd asked that in 83 or 85, pretty much the same. The answer would not have been that it was unlikely. It was impossible. It's not really thinkable, so the question wasn't asked. But it did happen, actually. And then a few years later, actually, Nelson Mandela, black Nelson Mandela had been in isolation for, I, f I don't know exactly, perhaps 27, 29 years, something like that, became the president of South Africa without a violent revolution. I remember my friend Tony Lewis of the Times writing a column saying, in words that were very unusual for columnists, it's impossible that there will be this political change in South Africa without a violent revolution. And that's what was regarded, but it did happen. So that's the good news. Uh, miracles of that sort, and I could name others that I've experienced in my own life, in the life of this country, they are possible. The bad news is it will take a miracle like that for us to escape the consequences of what we're actually doing and programming right now in nuclear weapons, uh, in the possibility of wars between nuclear states like the U.S. and Russia, or for that matter, India and Pakistan, and in reducing to zero by 2050, uh, less than 30 years from now, fossil fuel emissions into the uh, atmosphere. That's the goal, to keep this uh, as habitable a planet as it is now. That's not happening. The emissions are going up. They show every sign of going up now. Uh, so it will be a very great transformation of our country. And I'm working on the assumption at 90 that I perhaps wouldn't have had at 50, that it is possible to see change like that. I've got an eight-week-old grandson. What can you say to kids that are coming into this world now? What, what might the world look like when he's 90? You know, when you ask that question, it makes me feel almost like the, the wicked stepmother or the fairy st godmother or something in the fairy tales who comes and curses the newborn child some way. And I certainly don't mean to curse them, uh, quite the opposite. I think you as a grandparent, and I know actually you are following the advice I'm about to give, Paul, but I think I have to say to the grandparents, this child will grow up into a world much, much less hospitable to human life than exists right now or has existed for millennia. Uh, if humanity exists at all in numbers greater than a hundredth or something of the current population as a result of nuclear winter, uh, these are very bad prognostications. And I think that you won't change that future unless you, as you are, Paul, uh, Paul, but not everyone, not every grandparent, unless you are willing and able to face the difficulty of this and which, which are the forces and the interests that are invested in keeping things on the course that they are, in other words, toward disaster. Because I don't think unless we name those forces to some extent and recognize them and find ways to organize and enlighten people and to challenge them, uh, they will have their way and will stay on our course uh, as it is, which, let me sum up, I'm, I'm saying I think your grandchild is born on the Titanic. And it hasn't, we haven't yet hit the iceberg. But we, all of us at this time, are of course on that same ship, or what Nikita Khrushchev called our ark during the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, and uh, aptly. And we're heading into ice. And indeed, the, uh, the captain of the ship has been warned of the ice ahead, as was true on the Titanic, historically, and so far has chosen to go full speed ahead on a dark night into that warned ice. 
instead of, as other ships in the same vicinity did with the same warning, stopping dead in the water for the night so as to uh, have daylight when, when moving or to move ahead very slowly so it would be sure to see any obstacle in the way or simply to go south and extend the, uh, the voyage, which was acceptable for virtually every ship, except the Titanic, which wanted to set a speed record and couldn't afford to go south if it were to do that or to stop in the water and so full speed ahead. What was needed then was a kind of mutiny by the captain against the wishes against of the head of the uh, White Star Line, Ismay, who was on that ship and wanted a speed record, or if the captain, who wanted to be on the board of White Star, made the foolish, reckless choice of moving ahead. The first mate did have, theoretically, and actually a power to say, that's not acceptable, we can't have that, a kind of mutiny, saving the lives of the people, knowing, by the way, that they did not have lifeboats enough for even more than a third of the passengers because, for money reasons, the first-class passengers needed patios outside their cabins from which lifeboats had to be removed in the design. Exxon, Chevron, Aramco are inducing our politicians who they pay with campaign donations uh, and other ways and uh, their influence on the president in terms of jobs and again campaign donations and whatever to allow them to continue exploring for oil that should remain in the ground if, civ if our current civilization is to continue and to, to get it up and without a mutiny in Congress and on pressure on Congress and the president to change that policy uh, the basis for hope would disappear. I'm assuming that there there is a possibility of doing that, difficulty as it is. On the nuclear aspect, uh, Northrop Grumman, which is, has just won a contract to develop a ground-based strategic deterrent, new intercontinental ballistic missiles, which should not exist and have been a danger to humanity for at least the last half century. An inexcusable, unconscionable danger of uh, bringing about the ice, nuclear winter, if used. Uh, and uh, it's not only Northrop Grumman, they beat out Boeing for that contract. They are subcontracting, of course, to Lockheed. And we have General Dynamics and uh, Raytheon, uh, Big Five, actually, uh, who were pushing the idea of a $1.7 trillion uh, modernization, revitalization, as they say, of a doomsday machine that can destroy not all life on Earth, not even all human life, probably, almost surely, but 90% of it, 7 billion people, if we exercised our current war plans in, the large, in, a, in a war against Russia. Now, as I say, it's a moral catastrophe that this country built such a machine. And was then it was a moral catastrophe for the world and for Russia when they imitated it about a decade later. Now, there's two of them poised on hair triggers, the hair trigger being the ICBMs on both sides that are vulnerable to being attacked by the other and subject to warning, tactical warning, that each side has invested billions and billions to achieve that has often proved false that they are about to be attacked and therefore the president or in president Soviet Union of Russia now has to decide in minutes whether to use them or lose them. Use them to do what? Oh, to hit the other side's ICBMs, which warning is telling us are already on the way uh, not to quit, or to do it earlier. If we had a war in the Ukraine where uh, it's likely to escalate Nuclear war is coming. Do we use our ICBMs now before they're destroyed or later? That is a question that it's wrong for any human to be 
asked you know, to have the, the circumstances. Abraham Lincoln said, if slavery is not wrong, then nothing is wrong. If the existence of a doomsday machine, I, again, I'm talking about an elaborate system that is developed by major corporations that profit from it and politicians that profit from it in jobs and uh, uh, a general ideology that, that endorses this, including media. If that's not wrong, then nothing is wrong. It is wrong. It is wrong for us to, to maintain that, and that is what we're doing, Democrat and Republican alike, uh, on this issue. There's no major difference between the parties. It's a bipartisan policy to be prepared, ready, totally ready, uh, at the order of a president or someone else who has succeeded a president who's just been killed some way or put out of action. Many fingers could launch this. It's, it's impossible to paralyze uh, by human attack, to paralyze this system. And it's a system, as I say, which we've known for 30 years now will have the effect, if launched, of destroying about 90 percent, perhaps 99 percent, probably not 100 within a year from starvation because the uh, uh, harvests have been killed for years, uh, perhaps a decade, uh, and, and uh, the rivers have turned to ice and the lakes and whatever else. Uh, and yet there's hardly any discussion of this. I was, uh, I'm, I'm reminded really, we're thinking of the fire on the one hand of, which will be caused, uh, that's caused the smoke that will cause the nuclear winter. For up to this time, the amazing fact has been revealed that the Joint Chiefs of Staff never calculate the effects of fire uh, from their attacks that they're planned and, and readied because it's too hard to calculate, supposedly uh, not really true. But it depends on wind, it depends on the fuel, uh, the uh, load uh, of the uh, cities. Uh, that will uh, be set on fire, the particular targets and so forth. So too hard to calculate compared to fallout or blast or prompt radiation. But actually, uh, another thing they then fail to calculate, for 40 years into the nuclear era was smoke, the effect on smoke. Because where there's fire, there's smoke. And in the case of nuclear weapons causing fire, they will cause firestorms of a, of a kind we tried to uh, uh, produce very widely by firebombing by the British and the Americans in Germany and then the Americans in Japan. But we only achieved it three times, Hamburg, Dresden, and Tokyo, a firestorm that would, law, would cause intense uh, temperatures on the surface but what people didn't eat and kill everyone within a, a given area, 100,000 people in one night in Japan, in Tokyo, March uh, 9th and 10th. They tried to create firestorms in 60 other cities after that, but didn't get it, killing about 900,000 Japanese civilians before Hiroshima. But Hiroshima caused the firestorm. With that, you can do it every time. And the firestorm, has the unanticipated effect, didn't calculate it, of causing the smoke to rise into the stratosphere, to launch it upwards into the stratosphere where it won't rain out. Due to one city, uh, the effect of that, like Tokyo or even Hamburg and Dresden, the effect is not really perceptible on the Earth. Do it to 100 cities and our, when I started working on war plans, uh, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 1961. Um, the Joint Chiefs uh, intended to hit every city in Russia and China, over 100,000 and many less than that, hundreds of cities. Uh, the effect of that would be to put enough smoke and soot into the stratosphere where it would go around the globe very quickly within days or a week or so, that would cut out 70% of the sunlight and cause 
ice age conditions on the Earth. So fire followed by ice. And uh, uh, you know, frost, well, I, you know, I think of frost here in this connection. I, I actually saw frost for, uh, recite his poem in 61 at the inauguration of John F. Kennedy. The wind blew the leaves, his, uh, leaves of his speech away, his poem away, and I, I remember this, this little embarrassing news because he was old. But of course he had already written the poem Fire and Ice. I don't think that's the title of it, but it goes, some say the earth will end in fire, some in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I tend to favor fire. But from what I know of hate, ice is also great and will suffice for destruction. Ice is also great and will suffice. Anyway, that's what we're building toward. And that existed in 1960, 61 in, and really had existed as a U.S. capability for about 10 years before that. So uh, I say again, there's no excuse for the continued existence of this for one man or one nation to have the capability to do that. And uh, the climate issue is very much the same. So at 90, and finally answer your question, uh, I've learned a good deal of disillusion about my country and about my species as long as well as learning how wonderful it is to live here, to be alive. And I'm, I'm still uh, never less conscious of that than I ever have been. I'm wonderful here with my wife of 50 years and our children, my son lives in the house. And uh, look at this in California. And yet, even in a world where most people do not have the privileges and the luxury uh, that we have, uh, or the security, I could think, although actually what I've described is, is not a whole lot of security looking toward the future, but from day to day, no comparison with most people in the world. And yet, with all that harm and oppression and inequality going on, I do choose to want to keep it going to keep it going, to postpone at least until we evolve in some cultural way, in a way that will make it possible for us to make the world less insecure, less inhumane for everyone. Denial of the threat of nuclear war is very comforting, facing up to it. It's very disturbing. You are the least in denial of anyone I know, yet you maintain a sense of joy. You always have a twinkle in your eye. You, you laugh and you smile easily. Most people, when I start talking about this, they say, ah, it's just too depressing. How do you keep your sense of joy throughout all of this? Well, here, my wife of 50 years here now, being married and uh, being with her, lying with her at night is heaven on earth. So I know what heaven is. And the other side of that is that hell is possible on this earth. As a matter of fact, uh, all the people doing these things, I think hardly any of them, do not convince themselves that they are making things less bad than they otherwise would be if other people were running it, that they have good intentions, but they are the kind of intentions that pave the road to hell. And that's the road we're on. Well, how do you smile on that road? You know, um, it occurs to me that one of my favorite books, very much so, when I was a kid, was a book called Scaramouche by uh, Raphael Sabatini. And I always remember the first line of that about uh, a, f a Frenchman in the uh, 18th, uh, 18th century. He was born with the gift of laughter and a sense that the world was mad. Well, what we've been talking about here is um, he was not wrong. Uh, 
the epigraph for my book recently I chose was from Nietzsche, one of the two epigraphs. Madness in individuals is something exceptional, but in groups, parties, nations, and epochs, it's the rule. And again, I think that's um, uh, what we're seeing, the, the sort of availability of humans to madness. In a way, um, it's capable, we're all capable of it. I think all humans are capable not only of participating in something mad out of a sense of group, teamwork, uh, going on delusional beliefs generally, and being obedient, being loyal, being patriotic, being courageous, all things that we generally regard as virtues, but they all have a dark side in that they can be put to work serving very bad interests in general, and that's where we are. So uh, for many of us, obviously, life is simply, as I said earlier, very privileged. My life is for, has always been a life of privilege compared not only to most people in the world, but most people in America. And, um, uh, it's a, and it's a privilege to have my family, to have my wife with us together, to have friends who are, who are also joining me in this effort is joyous. And uh, there's a lot of things to, to laugh about. But at the same time, I can't let go of this feeling, the belief I have that it's not impossible to avert these catastrophes that we're facing. And that it's, it's possible even to challenge the hoax that uh, entraps so many people. Uh, the Rokana and uh, Markey effort to stop the ground-based strategic deterrent, the continuance of which I think would mean that we were doomed to have a hair trigger on the doomsday machine indefinitely, and I don't think we would survive that indefinitely. Uh, the the, the um, programs of the new administration need improving, actually, in terms of climate, but they're an immense change and really offer hope, a, 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 an actual visible basis for hope that the emissions will go down. My hero, Greta Thunberg, who enlarged a vigil at the Swedish parliament, which Patricia and I actually participated in one very snowy, very cold morning once in Sweden, with about 50 or 60 people, had encouraged millions, uh, actually uh, a million or so, in a couple of weeks later, uh, a couple of months later, and a year later, several million, many million people protesting in a strike uh, on a school day. Uh, going from school, basically, and striking. But she could not be clearer in saying success is not measured in these numbers of people or even in her ability to speak to parliaments and to the UN and to Davos and so forth. She said, the emissions are going up. And that is the, the, what we're looking at. And that's failure so far. A willingness, in other words, she's shown this amazing moral courage and willingness to face not only the possibility of failure, but the, the existence of failure of uh, very many times, and yet to keep at it as she does with the others. And that's what, uh, that's what I'm privileged to be able to do, to keep at it. It's possible, and if it's possible, it's worth devoting one's life to trying to bring that about. Thanks for joining us, Dan, and happy 90th birthday. And thank you for joining us on theanalysis.news. Mm -hmm.